Have you ever been in a situation in which you were just browsing through the internet, minding your own business, and then suddenly your computer started acting weird? Weird in the sense, something just wasn't quite right. It was a bit slow and there were some weird folders popping up or you were just getting redirected to weird websites. Yeah, there's a high possibility that you tried putting it off to a virus and also tried installing an antivirus to, you know, correct the course of your situation. But in reality, there's a lot more to it. Hey guys, my name is Shivam. You are watching Elemental, where we talk about the smaller things in tech that make a much bigger impact on the real world. And this week, we will talk about viruses, malware in general, and antiviruses, and how they work, and more importantly, do you even need one? Yeah. Before we get started though, let me quickly remind you to subscribe to our channel, that is Gadgets360, and also remind you that new Elemental videos come out every Sunday at 1pm, so there's that, and also hit that bell icon for latest notifications. Just like in science, where we learn about disease-causing microbes or pathogens first before learning about the actual medicine, it's important to learn about these viruses, malware and spyware and all of that before we get to, you know, how we treat them, that is using antiviruses. Now, if you are a person who is just here to understand how antiviruses work, you can just directly go to this timestamp, but I don't recommend you do that. But anyway, let's start with the topic. Malware is actually an umbrella term. All right, that is uh, encompassing all kinds of you know malicious software. They can be viruses, they can be spyware, they can be worms, they can be ransomware. A lot of things come under the broader term that is malware. Now let's start with computer viruses. Computer viruses are designed to spread from host to host and have the ability to replicate themselves. And so they resemble an actual virus in a lot of ways in doing so. But instead of acting as a physical being, a virus exists as a code or a program. It works by inserting or attaching itself to a legitimate document or a document that supports macros in order to execute its code. Once it has successfully attached to the program, file or document, it will lie dormant or just hang around for a bit until circumstances cause the computer or device to execute its code. Yep, to activate a virus, you'll have to run an infected file or program. Once the virus infects your computer, the virus can infect other computers on the same network as well. A virus can steal passwords or data, log keystrokes or keep a track of what you're typing, cut up files, spam your emails and even take over your machine and turn it into a zombie. Now viruses are of different types. Now if you grew up in the 1990s or 2000s, there is a very high possibility that Trojan horse may bring back some not so fond memories. Now the name comes from a Greek story, a Greek mythological story, which I cannot really talk about much right now because it's very long. But if you want to check it out, do go down in the comments because there's a link waiting for you over there. It's a very nice story. So basically uh, Trojan horse viruses are named so because they imitate the mythical creature of Trojan horse in a lot of ways. It pretends to be harmless in order to trick people into downloading it. They may look like an mp3 or a legitimate piece of software and they seem to just sit around doing nothing going undetected. But then they can create backdoors to hackers to access your system and keep an eye on your online payments. But unlike other viruses, they don't self-replicate. Apart from Trojan horses, you also have boot sector viruses that can take control when you start or boot your computer. They are mostly spread through USB drives. You also have web scripting viruses that exploit the code of web browsers and web pages. If you access an infected web page, you can expect the virus to be downloaded on your PC. Then you have browser hijackers that hijack certain web browser functions and you may be automatically directed to an unintended website. You also have polymorphic viruses. Poly means many, morphic or morphos means forms. So these viruses change their code every time an infected file is executed. They do so to avoid and evade antivirus programs. Finally, you have macroviruses that are spread through Excel sheets or Word documents or basically any software that uses macros. These spread when you open an infected document, often through email attachments. While those were just viruses, there are also other forms of malware. 
Worms are standalone programs that can self-replicate and spread over a network. Unlike a virus, a worm spreads by exploiting a vulnerability in the infected system. But the biggest difference is worms can replicate without a host system and they do not require you to trigger them. They spread in about the same way as viruses, but additionally they can be passed on via FTP servers and public networks. Then there is ransomware that cuts off access to your computer until you pay a ransom. WannaCry was a ransomware that made headlines a few years ago, but it was also a worm because of its mode of spread. Further, you have adware that pushes unwanted advertisements at users and spyware that secretly collects information about the user. Then you have the dumbest of all malware. Scareware. These come in the form of emails in which the sender kind of threatens you or uh, tells you that they have recorded you using your PC or your smartphone's camera in a compromised position and they would not hesitate twice before putting that video on some porn site. Yeah, and then in return they want you to send them money in the form of cryptocurrency and they nicely add a link on the bottom of the email as well so that you can fall for it and do that. It's a very annoying thing and it's very scary at first, but it does happen more often than not. So now that you have understood all about viruses, malware, worms, spyware, adware, blah, 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 it's very easy for you to understand what antiviruses, anti-malware and anti-spyware do. Now, just in case you haven't watched this video all this while, antiviruses deal with viruses, anti-spyware deals with spyware, and anti-malware is a much more holistic approach of removing junk from your PC or smartphone, depending on what you use. Now, before we take a deeper dive into all of these, I want you guys to go down in the comments and tell me what kind of antivirus, anti-malware or anti-spyware you're using at the moment now. Okay, now it's time to see how these guys work. They normally work by four processes. The first one is called definition. There is a large database of malware and viruses out there. And this database is constantly being updated to keep a track of the newest malware. Definition is the process of comparing files on your system to the database. The bad files that match your database are defined as malware or virus. This is a good way, but it requires the system to be always up to date. And that's why they slow down your system. Now, some malware or viruses are not defined, but the anti-malware or antivirus can still identify suspicious behavior of a particular file. It doesn't require checking with the database, but it only requires keeping an eye on a particular file's behavior. This process is called heuristics and this can raise false alarms, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. The third process is called sandboxing. Whatever file isn't on the database, nor is it acting suspicious, but the antivirus thinks that it is a bit unusual. In this case, it runs the file in a sandbox environment or on a system that is not on your PC, but on a remote desktop. This way, your system will be safe even if the malware exhibits dangerous behavior and the anti-malware or antivirus would know that it's an unsafe file. Finally, you have quarantine and removal. Quarantine basically means that a suspicious file is taken in a sector of the hard disk that is isolated, right? So that it doesn't infect other things in the hard disk. But removal is basically removing that file permanently. Quarantine is just temporarily moving it to a different sector, but not deleting it permanently. And removal is basically just deleting a file permanently. Now, before we move on to the conclusion, I also want to talk about something else, and that is firewall, which is very crucial to understanding internet security. Firewalls carefully analyze incoming traffic based on pre-established rules and filter traffic coming from unsecured or suspicious sources to prevent attacks. They do so by using IP addresses and ports. Think of IP addresses as houses and port numbers as rooms within the house. Only the trusted source traffic is allowed to enter the house and then it's further filtered so that it's only allowed to access certain rooms. Hence the term firewall. <laughs> now comes the million dollar question. Do you need a standalone antivirus? Short answer, yes. Long answer, it depends on you, really. Now, Windows comes pre-installed with Windows Defender, which does a pretty good job at keeping viruses, malware, and worms at bay. But 
provided that you keep it updated time to time, right? And also, if you want to install some sort of additional standalone antivirus, anti-malware, anti-spyware software on your desktop or PC, basically, whatever it is, uh, you can do so by comparing them. There are a lot of options out there. You have Malware Bytes, you have Kaspersky, Kaspersky Internet Security, you have um, Avast, all of these guys, not in you can just go online and make a comparison. And since you have all the information that you need to compare these guys, the stuff that's written out there is no longer marketing mumbo jumbo. It's something that makes sense to you. And also if you're using an Android smartphone, there are a lot of over the air security patches that keep coming on your smartphone. So if you keep your smartphone up to date, mostly you wouldn't require a separate standalone app. If you want one, it's completely fine, but then it's up to you to decide if your smartphone has the resources, the processing power, the memory to run these apps. And having said that, it brings us to the close of this very interesting episode of Elemental. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do come down in the comments and let me know everything about it. Do share it with your friends as well. Remember that new Elemental videos come out every Sunday at 1 p.m. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And for all things tech, log on to Gadgets360.com.